As we look at the social agenda, the first thing I'd have to talk about is the concept of naive source knowledge. You have a malady, you start looking it up on the internet, you go to your doctor and you know more about it than he or she does. Or you know more about the effects of combinations of pharmace pharmaceutical prescriptions than they do. So who's the expert? You know, Dick Fosbury was the first person to high jump backwards. Who taught him how to do it? He figured it out for himself. And so this changes our relationship to the concept of authority. Because authority is not a thing, it's a process by which we see the solidity of a thing. So who is an authority anymore? And doctors are no longer number one on the list of most respected. Actually, pharmacists have beaten them. And politicians actually have fallen below used car salesmen. <laughs> so naive source knowledge. The second is the concept of gameplay. And gameplay is different today. In, in the lower right-hand corner, you see the key word that's called collaborative gaming. I'm going to guess all of you played the same games that I did as a kid. Monopoly, Parcheesi, Clue, <coughs> Shoots and Ladders, my favorite of them all, Yahtzee. Broke with a Yahtzee all night long. Today, kids don't play those games. They play collaborative games. See, because when we played our games, you know, my job was to beat your ass. <laughs> Especially if it was my sister. <laughs> Competitive gaming. Collaborative gaming is you play together to beat the game, not to beat each other. Play together to beat the game, not to beat each other. This is how they're teaching introductory physics at MIT. There's no more lectures. You're a group of six people. You all get the same grade in the end. Okay. Um, collaborative gaming would be the second great thing. The third is tribes. And what I'm really talking about is neo-tribes. It's not going backwards into how tribes exist, but it's taking how tribes interacted and putting it in the context of today. And tribes use lots of ritual, opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies. I'm trying to help a spirits provider reinvent the shot so that it's a lot smaller. Because if you're drinking shots all night long, that's not good. But you want the ceremonial toast. It's part, and particularly that's powerful with the 25-year-old set of today. And the way we manifest tribes is both a hyper-local and also what I would like to call a wide area. So you actually have multiple tribes and you particularly look at your extended friendships and so forth in a different tribal context than, than the local. This adds into, particularly as we get more and more looking at people, something that's now called transmedia. And transmedia is the confluence of purchased media, owned media, and earned media. Purchased is the ads that you put in television, newspaper, whatever. Owned is what your web activities would be, but earned is what other people say about you. And this is making it such that if Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message, and look closely, because really what he said is the medium is the massage. You can see I'm going back and forth there. Today, I am the medium, and I am the message, or the massage. I am the medium, and I am the message. And if Lady Diana was to die in the tunnel today, the single most important person in the world that day would have been the person with the video camera and would be for quite some time. Uh, next, I want to talk briefly about art. Because at the end of World War II and the postmodern movement was created where the world's artists, uh, whether the ideological background is monarchy or uh, communism or, or um, liberal democracy um, or fascism, all the arts world felt like they were taken advantage of and what they call the academization of art. And we ended up not looking at beauty, but parsing beauty. Not appreciating beauty, but taking it apart. I guess that's how you get elephant dung as art. Um, but art is always a window in the times, and beauty begets art. And what we've seen is that art begets design, and we've seen the total democratization of creativity. And we were just talking about how easy it is to go and get yourself a logo for $100 by auctioning it on the internet for people to do, or $200. And so everybody's a creative today. 
everybody can not only Photoshop, but um, one of my favorite anecdotes to see how this happened was when the Olympics were open ceremony in China, how they had their fireworks enhanced on video as opposed to doing it live. And the Boston Pops did the same thing for the 4th of July fireworks, just past 4th of July in Boston. Uh, let's get into technology a little bit, and I want to make sure I get this on. Is this is the first time we're seeing a generation accept technology at retirement age. Right? We're back and forth there, how we doing? Um, never happened before. You know, my grandfather had to be convinced he wanted air conditioning in a car. It used to be an option. Right? My dad, no way I'm going to try to understand the internet. Now, the 65-year-old has spent enough of their career having to engage it, they recognize the power of it, that we, we are seeing a huge movement, and of course, don't forget the concept of the digital native is now old enough to be hired. And these are people who spent the entirety of their life with the internet as part of it, 1994 till 2012, and suddenly, we have a whole new generation. The rest of us can be at best a fast follower. Um, I went to church recently and I noticed cell phones started going off. I said, gee, that hasn't happened for years. And I realized that eight-year-olds had finally gotten them. <laughs> and didn't understand the protocol yet if you turn them off when you go to <laughs> Ted told us this morning. But other things. The confluence of pharmacology, neuroscience, and behavioral sciences is giving people the understanding, the ability to understand their motives, their moods, um, like we've never, never seen before. And we're going to see an incredible influence of mood management in the next 20 years and adjusting your mood. Uh, as we get down to uh, not only what nutrition has to offer, um, but um, what's her name? Sally uh, Fallon, if you're not familiar with her work. Um, the opportunity to eventually, through you know, through the genome, to perhaps even have diets based on your blood type. So, with that kind of as a backdrop, so how do you lead in the epic of uncertainty? Well, Ted said it as he introduced uh, our morning is thought leadership. But the other, you know, if intellectual property is the driver of the future, thought leadership is the fuel. But the second is what I like to call disproportional influence. Because you can't control things anymore, you can just be disproportionately influential. I was working with a landscape architect in Texas. He said, we want to be the biggest. I said, well, I guess you are in Texas. But why would you want to be the biggest? If you could be disproportionately influential on your industry, wouldn't that be the most? But sure enough, as it turned out, as they created their vision to do that in their own way, it jumped their business in this kind of environment by 60%.